Hello, welcome to this webinar brought to you by the Asia Society Policy Institute's Center for China Analysis. It is the third episode in this series where we delve into the intricate uh, intersections of technology, geopolitics, and global affairs in the realm of AI. Today, we're navigating the complex landscape of military AI, US-China AI competition, uh, Huawei's recent 5G uh, breakthroughs, the effectiveness of US export controls, et cetera, et cetera. And we'll be talking about how to build a balanced framework in the world of AI regulation. I'm your host, Lizzie, and joining me are two amazing expert guests. First up, we have the distinguished Paul Shar. Uh, Paul Shar is the executive vice Vice President and Director of Studies at CNAS. Paul Shar is the award-winning author of Four Battlegrounds, Power in the Age of Artificial Intelligence. Paul, it's fantastic to have you here. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And joining us alongside Paul Shar is the equally distinguished Paul Triolo. Paul Triolo is a senior associate with the trustee chair in Chinese business and economics at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Paul's views and writings are frequently quoted in our national media outlets. Paul, thank you so much for being here with me. Great to be here. Now, as you might have noticed, we have two Pauls with us. So to keep things friendly and clear, uh, we will refer to them as Paul S and Paul T uh, throughout our discussion. So with that bit of housekeeping out of the way, let's jump right into our conversation. I should um, mention to our uh, uh, audience that you are free to use the webinar chat function to raise questions. Uh, we will leave 15 minutes at the very end of the webinar to address your questions. If your question is posed to a specific expert, please make that clear in the question. So for the first part of our uh, of our discussion, we're going to turn to military AI and diplomacy. And here I'm going to turn to Paul S. Um, many of our audience will remember the recent diplomatic discussions between President Biden and President Xi concerning the responsible use of AI military applications. So Paul S., can you just give us some insights into how AI technologies are currently utilized in military applications and why their integration is considered a game changer in modern warfare. Well, thanks so much and, and very excited for the discussion today. Uh, there were certainly some, some tantalizing hints prior to the Biden Xi meeting about um, a potential agreement between the US and China on guardrails on military use of AI. Uh, we ended up not coming to fruition as part of the dialogue, but the U.S. and China are talking, which is really important because this is an urgent area that needs more attention. Um, and certainly both the United States and China are working hard to adopt AI into their militaries, as are other countries and non-state groups around the world. AI technology is pretty widely available and so we already see, for example, the use of image classifiers that are you know, based on machine learning, that can use machine learning to identify images uh, and objects and video feeds being used in drones in Ukraine. So uh, you don't need to necessarily be uh, one of the world's most advanced militaries or leader in AI to use AI technology in the military. Uh, but there's some tremendous opportunities to do so, to process information faster, to make better and faster decisions. And um, there's a lot of value in the U.S. and China looking for ways to manage some of that competition because there are risks um, in using AI systems that are unreliable and risking you know, potential accidents or escalation and making sure that we don't see countries engage in a race to the bottom on safety where they're deploying military AI systems before they're safe. Fantastic. So, Paul, as moving on to uh, China's military AI development, can you give us a concise overview of the current state of, of development, the potential challenges, as well as the implication for global security? Yeah. So, the um, you know China is very keen to use AI to improve its military. Uh, we see them doing experiments like large drone swarm demonstrations, um, doing um, experiments using AI fighter pilots. Uh, oftentimes, if the U.S. military does a major demonstration, we'll see China follow suit not very long after. And in Chinese writings, they talk about the importance of intelligentizing warfare, about using 
AI and other digital technologies, computer networks, big data, cloud computing, to help process information faster. Um, I think China, like other militaries, are trying to figure out what do you do with these technologies to use them most effectively? And that's one of the things that stands out in the history of warfare is that oftentimes new technologies proliferate pretty quickly, but what matters most is figuring out how do you use this most effectively? Um, and and that, that pattern of innovation is probably going to be one of the decisive factors in which militaries are going to stay ahead. Fantastic. And in the, in the realm of military AI, um, are there channels or what are the channels for the United States and China to establish international norms and agreements that both sides can commit to? We know uh, military to military communication had been on hold for quite a while uh, before the discussion between President Biden and President Xi. Well, certainly direct uh, bilateral communication is really key. So it's encouraging to see progress in that domain. And hopefully AI is an important area of conversation. But there are also international forums. There's obviously a tremendous amount of international discussions going on underway about AI more broadly. Uh, the Bletchley Park Declaration at the UK summit very uh, recently that both the US and China signed. Um, you know, China had rolled out their own global AI governance initiative. But on AI, uh, military use in particular, there was the Responsible AI and the Military Summit, the REAIM Summit, um, just last year, and there's another one coming up. So that's another opportunity for both nations to then shape global norms and expectations, either independently or ideally together, about how AI should be used in the military. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Paul S., for your insight. Shifting our focus a little bit, we're going to turn to the second part of our, of our discussion where we talk about um, the relative strength in AI between U.S. and China. Um, there are recent media support uh, reports suggesting that China and the U.S. are actually nearing parity in AI development. <laughs> uh, Paul T., I'm going to turn to your expertise <laughs> there here. While the U.S. leads in fundamental AI technology and research, China is actually rapidly implementing them in practical applications. So what factors drive this divergence in the style of U.S. development and, and what are the potential implications? Great question, uh, Lizzie. And I'm not sure I would couch it quite like that. I think, you know, companies in both countries uh, have been deploying AI for a long time. Uh, in various types of applications. Um, so I think it's important to just step back quickly and define what we mean by AI here. What, uh, in, in 2017, I wrote an article with Kai-Fu Lee where we tried to um, look at China and the US uh, and where they were in AI development. And we broke it down into several different categories. You know, internet sort of based AI, things like recommendation algorithms, uh, business and enterprise uh, focused AI, uh, things like logistics um, and uh, you know business operations. Uh, perception AI, um, which is things like facial recognition, object recognition, um, and then aut autonomous AI, which which is things like uh, AI being used as part of autonomous vehicle systems, ADAS systems, for example. Um, so in all those areas, um, we looked at who, which country was leading, which companies were leading. And China, of course, was very early on, companies like Alibaba uh, were, and, and Tencent were using AI algorithms um, for in, in things like e-commerce, um, transactions, um, and also in things like logistics. So Chinese companies were very, very early users of AI algorithms in very sort of, you know, application related uh, processes. Perception AI too, China, Chinese companies were leaders, Chinese researchers that had done a lot of research and, and participated in international conferences on, on perception AI, things like natural language processing. Um, and then on autonomous, we gave the U.S. a little bit of a lead here. So we tried to break it, you know, get under the hood and, and get away from just, you know, AI. Um, I think if you look at sort of across the AI stack, uh, you look at um, things like um, data, ac access to data, and then the sort of hardware area, that's a, that's a tricky one. Uh, Kaifu has said, you know, talk about China leading in, in, in data. That's a complicated issue. But yes, they have a lot of data sets that, that may be unique. Uh, each of the companies, for example, developing AI in China has access to big data sets. Baidu has a, you know, 20 years of search history. Tencent has a lot of transactional data. Alibaba has a lot of uh, e-commerce and logistics data. Um, but I think the interesting thing is, as we get to, to the current situation, which is where the, the big focus is on generative AI and large language models, we're sort of in a, in a little bit of a different world. And there, yes, arguably U.S. companies like OpenAI, um, inflection, um, 
a lot of the, the sort of the sort of foundational leaders are 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 leading in the sense of of, of innovating and designing um, new 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 approaches to generative AI. Transformers, for example, came out of came out of uh, you know U.S. the U.S. research uh, community here. So so in that sense, um, the U.S. is is U.S. research is leading. But Chinese companies are quickly you know coming up to, up to speed on, on on these in these areas and generative AI, um, both in terms of deployment of applications and in terms of sort of improving on. Um, existing models and developing their own models. There's something like 238 large language models now under development in China, which is a large number. Um, and certainly companies like Baidu with uh, Ernie Bot that they just put out, um, it compares favorably, for example, in terms of um, of, of, of performance with, with ChatGPT uh, 3.5 and even ChatGPT 4. So the generative AI is sort of an, a new area where it, it, it comes out of the natural language processing and image processing. Um, but it's still the use cases and the sort of applications are still being are still under development. And so um, trying to assess who's leading in that is, is, is a bit of a challenge. On the hardware side, though, I think obviously the U.S. and U.S. companies uh, in terms of developing advanced GPUs are, are far ahead of the game. And that's we'll, we, we'll talk more about that when we get to the export control piece of it and why that's such an, uh, an obsession of the U.S. government in terms of controlling Chinese company access to GPUs. But clearly, Chinese companies have been trying to catch up in, um, in the hardware development space. But that's really challenging. And Didia and AMD and Intel, for example, have uh, big leads there. Um, and uh, particularly in things like software development environments around AI, which, which, which is part of a critical part of the AI stack, um, Chinese companies are lagging, and and most 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 uh, developers use PyTorch and TensorFlow that you know kind of that come out of uh, Facebook and, and and Google, for example. Um, and so it depends on what you're talking about, what part of the AI stack, and 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 how how um, how how quickly Chinese the Chinese companies have have been able to sort of come up come up the learning curve. Um, so when you talk about who's leading in AI. You have to be very careful, I think, and quickly get under the hood and look at some of the individual uh, applications and, and processes. But definitely the, the general consensus in 2017, when, when I wrote that first paper, um, is that, that U.S. companies tend to be leaders um, in, in, uh, in sort of basic research and innovation in, in the space. But I think that's, you know, that's a that's a that's a general comment. But, you know, that's I think that's changing fast. Chinese researchers are very good um, in, in these areas. Um, and then, of course, in terms of application and using A.I., Across the across the board, uh, Chinese companies have been very out in front on all this. And generative AI finally is is the, the area where it's hard to say who's leading. Um, and well, that's just something that that will unfold over the next couple of years in terms of um, actual applications. Fantastic. And we'll be talking about sort of China's strategy to catch up, so to speak, on, on hardware and other fronts. But before that, uh, Paul T, can you also shed light on some of the industrial or commercial applications of AI technology that China is currently uh, prioritizing. I mean, I've heard a lot of talking about AI diagnosis. Um, I've heard sure. uh, AI powered, uh, you know, sort of automatic, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, driving, et cetera, et cetera. So what are those key areas of commercial applications that you sure. can see in China and where investors are now focusing uh, sure. in terms of China's AI landscape? Yeah, great question. And you know, again, going back a little bit, this has been a, an evolving uh, sort of situation in China. It, it, or, or the first wave of, of, of AI applications did tend to be in things like e-commerce, um, and in in the facial recognition area. Of course, public security in China was was interested in uh, in robust facial recognition systems, and so a lot of investment and money went into those to, into those um, companies. But I think now we're sort of in a in a different wave here, um, where um, we're looking at um, uh, companies actually need to make money now, and 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 also you know to, to 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 figure out applications that will drive revenue. So yes, one of the areas I would say is um, is medical diagnosis, um, and that's that's been again sort of in, in in around for a long time. But Chinese companies have been particularly good uh, in this regard. So just uh, this just this week, for example, um, there was an interesting paper released in in Archive that that talked about. Um, a, uh, a, a an AI uh, application for pa detecting pancreatic cancer, and it's an interesting it's interesting sort of data point here. It was it was written um, by by a whole range of authors from from uh, including from uh, Chinese uh, sort of medical researchers and Alibaba's Damo Academy was one of the lead authors, but there were participants from Harvard, Johns Hopkins, 
um, and, and a university in Prague. So that shows that particularly in that kind of application of medical diagnosis, it's a very global and, and, and cooperative uh, field where AI researchers in the US and China and other countries are all collaborating. Um, there's other really good companies like Infravision, which is a which is another company, Chinese company, started by two Chinese grad students who went to went to university in the U.S. They then went back to China and and trained their AI algorithm for detecting cancer um, uh, in China, working closely with hospitals. And then they deploy they're deploying that algorithm in the U.S., hiring engineers in the U.S. Um, and they have a presence in Europe, in the U.K., um, and then in, re- in the rest of the Asia Pacific. So in that and that's case it's a good example of a chinese ai company uh that that has that, that is able to go global because there are less maybe less sensitivities around uh things like medical diagnosis um uh, of, of tumors and other things right so so that th- there's some good examples of chinese companies in that the other area is adas systems as i mentioned earlier so a lot of chinese companies of course are are really advanced in in deploying ai applications in autonomous vehicles so if you if you look at a company like pony ai for example they have a level four uh, capability i've ridden in one of their vehicles in beijing with no driver in the front seat navigating a complicated suburb of beijing um and it was quite good it was way better than the tesla that i drive which is only level two uh two plus um but it really felt like the car was in control the whole time so chinese companies uh, including huawei and, and of course pony and we ride a bunch of other ones are really doing doing quite advanced work in ai algorithms applied to to autonomous driving um and then finally um with generative ai uh you see companies like huawei uh p- doing things like port automation so if you go to the, the this demonstration port in tianjin there's no workers there everything is being done uh remotely by a couple of people um, and it's all automated, and it uses a combination of AI and other techniques. 5G is, is of course, an important part of that. And then there are applications in mining. So Huawei is using its Pangu um, large language model, for example, in, 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 uh, as part of, a, of automation of mining operations. There's a big mining operation in Shandong um, that's all automated using a combination of, again, generative AI and um, and 5G. So there's, you know, th- those are the kinds of applications that are, that are a huge focus in China. Uh, right now. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Since you already mentioned Huawei, so let's turn to Huawei next. And we'll be talking more generally about China's quest for domestic AI uh, hardware and chips. So turning our attention to to Huawei, we know the company has faced challenges amid U.S. sanctions, et cetera, et cetera. And despite this, they've managed to re-enter the 5G phone market. Here, I'd really love to hear from both of you, starting with Paul S. So, Paul S., can you sort of detail the strategies employed by Huawei and what are the lessons to be learned from Huawei's breakthrough? Well, they're certainly going to make do with the, the technology that they have on hand um, and see as far as they can take that in terms of building more advanced chips. Um, I think what remains to be seen is how far they're going to be able to take that. And I think we'll see. They've, they've certainly been able to develop um, some more capable chips. I think the biggest question is going to be, can they scale that in a way that's cost effective? And one of the big unknowns here is U.S. export controls is then pushing Chinese companies to to maybe use the technology in novel ways or simply invest in new types of technology uh, for leading edge nodes or to circumvent those means of production and find potentially new different kinds of breakthroughs. Uh, In the short term, they're going to have significant challenges going forward. Um, It's it's clear that the export controls um, are going to be able to slow down some development and put some roadblocks in their way. I think in the long term, there's some very open questions and it's going to be very challenging for the U.S. controls to actually hold back Chinese chip development uh, over time. Fantastic. So, Paul T, please also chime in here. Um, how do you assess Huawei's current state of development in terms of its chip technology? What are the lessons we should learn from uh, Huawei's surprising breakthrough? Well, you have to put the breakthrough in some context. I, I got a hold of a, of a Mach 60 in, in Shanghai um, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, it's a very impressive device. So again, it's important to note that there are the two real big strands coming together here. One is the export controls on Huawei itself and the extension of extraterritorial export controls on Huawei that prevents it from using TSMC, for example, to manufacture those advanced chips. And the other ex- strand of export controls, which is newer, coming from last October 7th, is our controls on SMIC, the domestic foundry that actually manufactured this chip 
probably at the seven nanometer node, although you know, the, b- both companies are being pretty mum about the origin of this chip. But basically what happened was high silicon, which is the, 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 the chip design arm of Huawei, was designing at a very advanced level before the US put controls on Huawei uh, in 2020. And so high silicon was, de- was, was designing at five and three nanometers. And so ha- what, what Huawei has been able to do is, is turn that high silicon design around and use it uh, with SMIC's ca- capacity to do some layers at seven nanometers using their existing tools. Now, those tools that uh, that uh, SMIC used, they've had since 2019. The the actual uh, techniques for manufacturing advanced semiconductors at that level using those tools that SMIC has are well known in the industry. So even before the October 7th controls, SMIC and Huawei had all the everything they needed to actually manufacture that chip. Now, the challenge is manufacturing that chip at commercial uh, yields and scale. So there's still a lot of questions about, as Paul noted, about you know whether whether uh, SMIC can can ramp up and manufacture the tens of millions of systems on a chip that you need if you're going to be sort of competitive in the smartphone business. This is a very different mo- business model, for example, than say, you know, 5G base stations. Um, and so there's still some some question about whether how, how quickly and rapidly SMIC can ramp up to produce the numbers of, of, of uh, systems on a chip that Huawei will need. And then where they go, what's the roadmap going forward? There's still a lot of concerns about that. Currently, the thinking is you can take the equipment that SMIC already has, the advanced uh, DUV lithography equipment, for example, probably can go to some level of like five nanometers. It's capable of doing that, but it's just really challenging to do that uh, and, and get the yields you need uh, to, to, to sort of produce the, 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 the the, the again, sort of tens of millions of chips. Before the export controls, for example, Huawei was producing 250 million chips, the Kirin 9000 series at TSMC. Um, so that's the kind of scale you need um, to be able to sort of produce generation after generation of chips. Now, one thing we should just quickly mention too is that the US export controls, one effect of, the, of them has been to force Chinese tool makers to get better, to sort of be more innovative. And so what we've seen, for example, is the sort of vertical integration of Chinese chip tool makers uh, working very, very closely with the foundries in China, like SMIC and, and Ball Hong, um, which is another key player. So. Um, it's it, the when you try to f- determine how effective those the export controls are. Of course, they're effective in cutting off uh, some access to technology. But Chinese companies have been pretty effective in working around that, as we see from the the, the Mot 60. Um, and also, Huawei used a lot of very interesting engineering techniques to try to uh, uh, to try to mitigate some of the the, the deficiencies of, of having to use the the less advanced node. So, for example, things like uh, power consumption, they they managed to to do some novel things to to improve performance there, and they've included in the Mot 60 some 6G, 5.5 or 6G capabilities like satellite communications, satellite messaging, and satellite phone calls. So they're really pushing the envelope in terms of engineering, um, using their existing tools and using the existing capabilities that Chinese companies have. So it's a pretty impressive feat, uh, you know, regardless of what you think of of, of the export controls. Thank you so much. Uh, So, you know, we talk about Huawei and SMIC, um, but what's sort of the general status of China's domestic chip development, especially compared with global leaders. Um, I want to hear sort of a, a evaluation from both of you. And, you know, besides Huawei and SMIC, as we mentioned, who are the prominent players in this mm-hmm. in this place that we should be, you know, on the watch out for? Um, please, uh, starting with Paul S. Sure. So I think, I mean, China's indigenous chip making capacity has uh, lagged behind industry for a very long time. It's an area that they've struggled to develop despite a tremendous amount of government investment in this space. Now, of course, the export controls change that dramatically in two key ways. One is that the U.S. controls, along with Japan and the Netherlands, on chip making equipment, make it even harder for foundries like SMIC to be making chips because they're cutting off their access to the most advanced technology, things like extreme ultraviolet lithography and associated other uh, tools and, and equipment. Um, however, what the U.S. export controls also do is create enormous market incentives for Chinese chip makers and equipment providers to then find ways to innovate because the US controls, the extra territory controls on the chips themselves now create this, this huge market um, for advanced chips inside China, are the kind of chips that, that Paul was talking about that Huawei was making, now they're denied access to from TSMC, from their advanced nodes. And so uh, there's now big advantages inside China for finding ways to maybe be more creative using uh, deep ultraviolet lithography, seeing how far can you go there 
I think very much an, an open question. Um, but we've also seen that uh, not just in China, but globally, uh, there's been this huge explosion of companies in the design space. Mm -hmm. So while there's been a concentration of companies on the foundry space, at each node, there's fewer and fewer um, companies you know, making the most advanced chips, manufacturing them. In the design space, there's lots of companies designing chips, um, and a lot of Chinese companies are doing innovative things in the design space, and that's a room for them to continue to grow, uh, you know, kind of to some extent bottlenecked where you know within the the nodes that they're going to have access to on the manufacturing side, but continue to innovate in design. And so um, I think you know we'll, we're going to see how far China can push that, but there's big incentives for them to do so to try to meet that market. Thank you so much. And turning to Paul T, how would you yeah. assess China's current state of development in terms of- Yeah, that's that's a great question, Lizzie. And I, I've actually got a paper in draft that, that that's looking at sort of where China is overall in the semiconductor industry. Um, so just a quick highlight, I agree with Paul on the design design side, Chinese companies are very advanced. High Silicon was designing chips, you know, uh, that are were comparable to Qualcomm um, and other other leading companies in, in the sort of, you know, smartphone space. Um, and you've got other companies like Unisoc and, and Xiaomi, um, a lot of the a lot of the phone companies have tried to get into design. It's a really tricky thing to get into, though, because it's a, it's a big commitment financially if you're going to really get into advanced semiconductor design. Um, but you also have companies in the GPU space like VRen and More Threads that were also added to the, to the entity list um, around October 17th. But the big players in China, like Alibaba and ByteDance, are also designing their own chips. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot of players in that space. Horizon Robotics, for example, is another key player designing edge uh, AI semiconductors uh, and, and, and is doing quite well. Um, the, the problem, as Paul notes, uh, is fabbing this stuff. And how, you know, how do you fab this stuff when, when in some cases you're cut off from doing advanced designs at TSMC? Um, if you're a Chinese company that's on the the, uh, the FDPR entity list, for example, um, which will prevent you from using TSMC. So a lot of these companies are on those lists. Um, so in China, you have um, SMIC and, and you have four really major fabs. You have SMIC, Huahong, and then for memory, you have Yangtze Memory, YMTC, and, and, and CXMT. Uh, and uh, each one of those has ha, is under some sort of US sanction and is trying to work figure out a way around this by working with the tool makers. CXMT today just announced a, a you know a, a breakthrough in in DRAM for example um but again if you look at that it's 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 basically 2020 technology or 2018 2019 technology so a lot of the 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 efforts in the fab space are chinese companies making catching up to basically two or three or four years ago of where where the what western leaders were so the challenge going forward is how do they how do they how do they keep moving up the the value chain so as i noted you know the chinese tool makers uh, and this is companies like naura and amec and smee these are companies that are that are that are competing with western tool makers like applied materials um, uh, LAM and KLA Tencor for metrology. And so all those companies in China now have, as Paul noted, have this incentive to, to get better, move up the supply chain, but also work more, much more closely with the, 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 um, the foundries, because that's really how the, how Western uh, tool makers work. Uh, all the U.S. tool makers, for example, work very closely with TSMC, and that's how you get better. You work with with the design companies designing advanced designs. Then you then the tool makers have to make better tools, and the and the companies that are fabbing those 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 chips have to figure out processes that can use those tools and 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 be used for manufacturing advanced designs. So all that is happening within China, but it's a big challenge because because as Paul noted, um, the export controls mean that that those foundries can't get access to. Uh, to EUV lithography, for example, which is what what many of the other foundries are using, Intel, uh, TSMC, and Samsung, and so they have to figure out a way around that. Now, there's lots of other things that the Chinese government and the Chinese companies are trying to do uh, to figure out uh, alternative approaches to things like advanced lithography, because really in this space, this these technologies, it's not like they're, that, that that U.S. companies or Japanese or, or, or Netherlands companies have have technology that's locked in a box. And then if you prevent China from getting it, um, you know, China can't do it. These are applied science. This is applied science. And so there's many different ways to do these things, for example, with the tool makers. And so Chinese companies and with help from the Chinese government are trying to figure out ways to do things differently um, and do things better and trying to get to some point where they can get back in the game of, of manufacturing advanced semiconductors. Probably next year, they'll have a 28 nanometer line that's all domestic tools, probably still with ASML, uh, lithography uh, as part of that, and then they'll move to 14 nanometers and have a fully qualified domestic uh, production line without any any 
largely free of Western tools, except for probably in, in lithography. So there's a lot of efforts underway in China to do that. And the, the Chinese government has revamped its whole approach to semiconductor industry policy um, and is going to be driving some some really innovative uh, efforts in that, in that sector, for example, to share uh, government R&D with a, a select group of Chinese commercial companies um, to try to push and, and get around and, you know, and sort of advance despite some of the U.S. export control. So this process is going to play out over the next two to three years um, uh, as China Chinese companies like SMIC extend the capabilities of their existing tools and try to figure out um, where to go from, from there. Fantastic. And in the next section, we're going to turn to the policy. We're going to discuss sort of the effectiveness of the United States policy of ex- export controls and sanctions and the Chinese policy of uh, semiconductor industrial policies, big funds, so to speak, uh, as Paul just mentioned. So I'm going to turn to Paul S. first. Um, as you know, the Biden administration recently expanded its set of uh, restrictions on exports of advanced computing chips to China. Do you see these new sets of rules as likely to be more effective in achieving uh, the administration's intended goals? Well, to some extent, um, we know that they are just because they, they capture now a wider set of chips. Um, and one of the things that we've seen is when the export controls first came out last year, NVIDIA, of course, adjusted their chip designs to fall under the threshold. U.S. now moving that um, that that sort of yardstick in terms of what's permitted. Um, and it's clear that the U.S. government is going to continue to be adaptive to what we're seeing uh, U.S. companies do, as well as Chinese companies and others, to try to cut off ways of China getting access to either chips or chip making equipment. Uh, but it's going to be a moving target. And you know whether it's ultimately effective in restraining Chinese uh, chip development and AI development is, I think, really challenging, not the least of which because when it comes to AI, there's actually lots of ways to get access to uh, the computing hardware that you need Chips themselves are one way to do that. But another way is through cloud computing providers. And the export controls you know, go after that as well, expanding the scope, looking at uh, data centers of Chinese companies outside of China. Uh, the executive order that the White House recently released begins to, to make moves on know your customer requirements for US cloud providers. And so those are some steps the US is trying to take uh, that I think are gonna be needed, ultimately, if the US is gonna have to try to find ways to be restricting Chinese companies' access to uh, cloud compute. I actually think cloud is a, is a better approach for the U.S. to take that can be a little more fine-grained in terms of its approach. Uh, the U.S. has talked about concern about uh, the Chinese military use, uh, human rights abuses inside China, and certainly with the recent export controls, a lot of concern about uh, what the uh, executive order talks about as dual use foundation models, so the most capable advanced AI models. And if you can control through, through the cloud, that actually can allow more fine grained controls, um, which could undercut some of these market incentives that exist that we've been talking about that are driving uh, Chinese chip development internally. So there could be a better approach over time. Uh, and then the last component that really remains completely unaddressed in all of this is open source AI models, which is to say that right now in the current setup, you have large US companies training cutting edge AI models and then releasing them open source, which entirely circumvents US export controls. So even if the US uh, is successful in restricting China's access to chips themselves, that doesn't matter if Chinese labs can go download Uh, an open source model, and then fine tune it at very, very low cost. You don't necessarily need the most advanced chips to do that. And so I think uh, we're going to continue to see the US government be responsive to changes in the marketplace and in the technology, Uh, but it is a moving target. And there's still a lot of gaps in US export controls. Fantastic. And uh, Paul T, please, your take on uh, the effectiveness of the new set of export controls. Yeah, great. Great, uh, great question, and uh, agree with 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 Paul's take on all this. I mean, I think the challenge here is, um, you know, these controls were not really designed for the some of the the current purpose they're being put. I think we have to remember this. They were designed in an era of weapons of mass destruction, um, where you had sort of small companies that were that were producing uh, a key widget that could be used or key material that could be used in a nuclear weapon. They were not designed to maintain U.S. technology dominance. 
or to prevent China from getting AI capability or high performance computing capability um, or deal with human rights issues, right? So I think that's one, that's sort of the backdrop of all this. And so we see this challenge in, in sort of Drawing, trying to draw lines around the technology that we saw with October 7th on the GPUs. NVIDIA right away came out with, um, uh, you know, uh, the, the CPU, GPUs that were just below the threshold. And we saw this again on October 17th. Um, so that just highlights the challenge of using things like export controls for these, these purposes that they weren't designed to do. And also you're trying to, in this age, you're trying to get on the, on the tool making side, for example, it's a global, it's a global issue. So you have companies in other countries that, that, that would need to align with the U.S. if you're going to have effective controls. Um, and there, um, you know, we, we at one point had the Vassenauer agreement, which was a, was, which was a multi lateral group, but Russia is part of that. So that's not sort of dysfunctional. Um, and so you've had to have these other sort of workarounds with the US and Japan and the Netherlands agreed to some collaboration on controls uh, around uh, semiconductor manufacturing equipment, but not on all controls. And so there's still a lot of disagreement. And the Dutch government, and Japanese government, you know, and the companies in those countries don't like the, the, the some of the controls because because China remains a you know a huge market for them, and they're they're reluctant to fully align. Um, so the the, the challenge of, of the export control sort of is is you know it's it's a tool that sort of arguably needs to be revamped. So it's not surprising that there there are ways that companies find ways around this, both on the U.S. side and the, on the China side. Um, and then the, the other piece of it that I think is important is, you know, what's the ultimate goal here? Is the goal to really prevent China from getting uh, advanced computing capability? Um, this is what this was called out last year, for example, in what I've called the Sullivan Doctrine, where National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan talked about advanced compute and biotech and green tech is these force multipliers that are of key national security concern to the U.S. Um, but advanced compute is a huge area, right? It's uh, it's it includes semiconductors, semiconductor manufacturing equipment, AI, quantum computing, and high performance computing. And China already, for example, has a very robust high performance computing ca ca capacity. AI comes into play where there's there, where there's some convergence of AI and high performance computing with the use of advanced GPUs, for example, to do acceleration for certain kinds of workloads in in the HPC space. And that's one of the arguments uh, for controlling these 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 technologies is that China could use high performance computing and already does to model weapon systems like hypersonic glide vehicles and missiles. Um, and so that's that's an argument that, that, that the administration continually makes that it's trying to control a small uh, group, amount of technology that has military end use. The problem is that those GPUs are the vast majority of them are used for non-military applications in China, they're used for drug discovery, or, uh, or you know, the, as we talked about, cancer uh, detection um, or materials development. So that so the vast majority are not used for military end use. And so the administration is controlling, in, in a sense, um, this this sort of very very dual use technology um, in ways that have a major impact on on China. So, for example, already after the October 17th controls, Alibaba and Tencent. Um, you know, said this would have a big impact on their their cloud services, right? These are companies that don't provide anything to the military, arguably, or very little to the military. Um, and they're they're commercial companies. They do their e-commerce companies and social media and gaming companies. But the impact of those October 7th controls is hitting them because they can't have a reliable long-term source of GPUs to do to offer uh, services in the cloud or or to design um um, uh, you know, generative AI models. Most companies in China have stockpiled about a two years worth of those advanced GPUs and will probably be okay for two years. But then after that, the question becomes, you know, what, what happens? What other workarounds are they going to be able to find to, to, to continue to have access to reliable, you know, advanced hardware? So again, the, the question of sort of how effective the controls are, it, it depends on, you know, what the, what, what you, what one believes is the end goal of this and whether this is, this is a realistic, to believe that that the U.S. government can control China, China's ability to develop high performance computing and advanced computing and AI um, by 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 controlling choke point so called choke point technologies like GPUs, um, and I think the jury is still out on that because um, you know it, it, the technology is very complicated and changes rapidly. Um, and these controls um, are ha there are ways to circumvent these controls, but the longer term issue is AI, you know, what, where, whether AI and, and how important that will be for national security and things like cybersecurity um, and, you know, enabling malicious actors to develop bioweapons using generative AI models. And that, that's the, that's the, that's the fear, I think, with the, in the U.S. government, in the, in the EO that Paul mentioned, uh, the, on AI EO, there was a big focus on national security re related issues around uh, AI. And then the sort of general fear that over the long term, uh, artificial general intelligence, whoever, whoever gets there first, will have a big advantage.
uh, both from a sort of national security and economic security point of view. But that's a that's a far far flung sort of concern um, to be implementing controls now. Uh, and, and again, that ha- again highlights my initial point that that these controls um, were not designed to prevent you know the future development of artificial general intelligence um, by some malicious actor or, or by, or by a, a country. Um, so it's a very challenging uh, uh, prospect. And in the short term, the, the big losers are uh, arguably, in this case, U.S. companies, the, the, you know, whether it's the tool makers on the manufacturing side or the tech companies like NVIDIA, Intel, Qualcomm on the uh, on, on the sort of uh, the, the, the chip sale side. So it's 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 a it's a challenging, uh, uh, you know, ch- issue for to determine, you know, are these effective and, and sort of who's winning? I see. So, Paul, since you mentioned, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the misalignment of incentives, so to speak, uh, here. Um, are other countries on board or to what extent are other countries like the Netherlands and Japan and Korea on board with a United States set of export controls and sanctions? And how are industry leaders to whom uh, China is still a vast market navigating the, this new regulatory landscape? Uh, how are they thinking about those export control measures? I'm going to start with uh, Paul S., please. Sure. Um, so on the export controls on the manufacturing equipment, I mean, U.S. has been uh, dragging Japan and the Netherlands along uh, reluctantly, as uh, you know, as, as Paul mentioned, <clears throat> they there are some disagreements between the allies on what specific kinds of, um, you know, where to draw the line on some of these controls. Um, and there's a lot of money at stake for these companies and frankly, all three of the countries, including, you know, U.S. companies. So it's a little bit different with U.S. companies, where U.S. companies, of course, have, depending on the company, but many of them have huge incentives to uh, be supplying technology, whether it's you know, chip making tools uh, to get that they can with export controls or chips themselves, as we see the case of NVIDIA, to the Chinese market. Um, and U.S. companies are going to find ways to, to you know, continue to supply to the Chinese market to the extent that they can, that it's permissible uh, by the U.S. government. Now, I think, you know, the the latest development on the chip export controls, for example, where when they first came out, there was a certain threshold by the U.S. government. NVIDIA redesigned their chips, released ones just under the threshold. Now we've seen the U.S. government move that even further. That's not, I just want to point out, it's not necessarily a bad thing if U.S. companies are saying, okay, we're going to go ahead and ship whatever the technology is just below the threshold that the U.S. government sets. If you set, set the threshold in the right place, that's fine. Um, what that may highlight is if then the U.S. looks at that and the government says, well, actually, we're not happy about that. Maybe we set the threshold in the wrong place mm-hmm. and we need to see some adjustments there. Um, but ultimately, like the big picture here, uh, and Paul was talking about sort of this wide, expansive set of these export controls, it is in the U.S. government's interest for these controls to be as narrowly scoped as possible for whatever goal they're trying to accomplish. And it's been a little bit uncertain exactly what is the goal the U.S. government has here. Um, you know, Jake Sullivan's given a number of speeches talking about, uh, and, and last fall when the export controls first rolled out, talking about the shifting the U.S. goal to keep China as far behind as possible in these technologies. But specifically with regard to the chips, U.S. government's talked about kind of these very narrow military-specific applications, WMD, hypersonic missiles. Okay, is that what they're going after? Is it to create some distance between Chinese labs and U.S. labs on the most cutting edge models, which are uh, now we're seeing very much dual use and have a lot of commercial applications, but also potentially applications in uh, enabling the development of chemical and biological weapons, in cyber tools, in basic scientific discovery? I think there's a lot of unknowns there. But we can already start to see with GPT-4 some, some kind of hints at some of those capabilities in potentially future models that may not be further down, uh, too far down the road. So is that the goal? Or is it just across the board to, to try to hold China back? Um, and right now, the export controls are so broad that they're affecting things like commercial cloud applications that are not only not militarily relevant, it's just hard to see the strategic significance to the U.S., even as sort of like a basic... Uh, you know, basic foundational science and technology advantage here. And so, you know, the extent that the U.S. can find ways to more narrowly scope these controls, obviously we want them to be multilateral uh, with allies, but to make them as targeted as possible, uh, it's going to be in U.S. interest in the long run to make sure they do that. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Paul T., please also weigh in here. Yeah, just real quickly on um, on Japan and the Netherlands, 
You know, this is a complicated issue because um, neither of those countries has, for example, the type of end use controls or domestic person controls that were included in the U.S. package on October 7th. And so that has complicated the issue of getting getting some level of collaboration. And um, and companies in those countries like ASML, for example, in the Netherlands are really, you know, they're a huge company. They, they, they they're, they're sort of the, the, the Google and the Intel all rolled into one of, of the Netherlands. And so the Netherlands, the Dutch government has not been eager, uh, for example, to go along with all the U.S. controls. On October 17th, for example, um, the U.S. added a, a added a, a technology parameter uh, called dedicated Chuck overlay, which is a, which is a you know, DCO, which is a really complicated term, but it refers to how, how you get accuracy, for example, in DUV lithography systems. Um, and that and that meant that the Dutch now have to control much older gear, so gear that's more than 10 years old, um, that could be used by some end user in China, for example, to try to, to, to get around some of the limitations on the end use controls that the U.S. has imposed. Um, and, the, and the ASML, of course, is, is, is livid about this. <laughs> Um, because you know they they don't this is not cutting edge technology in their view um, and you know they have a lot of a, a lot of uh, equipment in China that 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 falls under this this these categories um, and so both the Japanese government and the Dutch government for example uh, are are really um, not eager to to align. Um, fully on these controls because it, because because their companies are going to be the ones impacted. In the case of Japan, Tel and Canon and Nikon, for example, are all uh, producing you know uh, equipment, and China is a huge market. Those countries are also concerned about Chinese retaliation, which we haven't talked about. Um, and there's 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 a growing concern that China will retaliate against uh, against some of these controls. So this week, for example, I think tomorrow or Friday, uh, Chinese controls are on graphite. Um, will go into effect. And the graphite controls they put into effect were a direct response to the October 17th controls. So China has not yet pulled the trigger, for example, on on some of these restrictions they put in place on gallium and germanium last summer in response to U.S. export controls, um, and in 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 in, uh, in October around graphite. But that's the concern that 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 companies uh, and in, in countries that are that are aligning with the U.S., for example, on some of these export controls could be impacted by Chinese retaliation. So, uh, as Paul rightly knows, I think the, the 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 argument in in the Netherlands and Japan is that these controls should be very very narrow. Um, and before October seventh, there was a there was some understanding about how narrow the controls uh, should be among amongst some of those allies. And then when the October seventh controls were released, they turned out to have been expanded considerably. Uh, for example, around some of the end use controls, and that surprised U- U.S. allies. And so that the last year has been in part uh, you know very detailed negotiation around trying to get an, an arm twisting allies to to align with those those more expanded controls. Uh, and so getting back to Paul's uh, other great points, um, you know, Jake Sullivan has talked about a small yard high fence. But if you look at the, the, the U.S. P- policy and other aspects of, of what Jake Sullivan has said, for example, around advanced compute, you know, the yard is is pretty big um, and 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 um, and the fence, you know, is is sort of you know growing. Um, uh, and be, but because of these other these technologies are, have global supply chains. The yard is necessarily large because you do have other countries and companies involved in this. Um, and so that's been part of the challenge is, is that the discussion has been around that this, this is a narrow approach, but in reality, it's been a much broader approach. And that has impacted um, a lot of companies in the supply chain and the semiconductor supply chain, and arguably a lot of US technology leaders who, whose argument is that access to the China market is important for them to c- continue to do R and D and and maintain their leadership position in these advanced technologies, and that that's a national security issue. That argument hasn't gotten a lot of uh, attraction in, in in Washington, um, but that's what the how the industry views views the controls, um, uh, sort of verging away from a very very narrow focus on on a, a smaller set of advanced technologies. Fantastic. Um, let's turn to the other side of the coin, so to speak. How would you assess the likely success versus the failure of China's industrial uh, policy when it comes to semiconductor, big fund, big fund version two, et cetera? Uh, starting with Paul S., please. Well, certainly we've seen that uh, China's been willing to invest tremendous amounts of money in uh, not just chips, but other areas in terms of industrial policy with missed success. And in some areas, they've had uh, significant progress. Uh, chip making has been a long struggle. Um, I think, you know, big picture, a lot of these efforts, they're very inefficient, they're very wasteful, but the government uh, has been willing to spend tremendous amounts of money and they've been able to make progress in a number of significant areas. Now, again, one of the biggest challenges here with chips is uh, it's not just money in the past. Uh, Money has not been enough to get there. 
But what's different now is that there are these market incentives for uh, Chinese uh, tool makers, chip makers to be meeting this demand. And, you know, that creates these feedback loops where you've now got, uh, you know, as Paul was talking about earlier in our session here, tool makers working closely with the chip makers, getting that kind of feedback and you know, getting products out into the marketplace, engaging with um, you know, users, whether it's other companies or, or commercial users, and getting that feedback on performance is going to help to level up quickly. Um, and certainly that's a, a very different kind of role that the government plays than we see here in the United States. We've seen some movement, of course, recently in the U.S. in terms of the U.S. government taking a bigger role in science technology innovation with the CHIPS Act and, and significant amount of funding towards uh, U.S. chip making here, R&D, and uh, more advanced foundries here in the U.S. Um, but, you know, in general, still the U.S. government's been just much more reluctant to be engaged, uh, for better or worse. Obviously, government spending can be much more inefficient um, than than the private market. But there are lots of ways where government investment in basic R&D might be doing things that private companies aren't willing to do on their own. Yes. Turning to uh, Paul T. Yeah, I think, you know, and again, I'm writing a, a, a fairly detailed paper on this, on China's sort of reaction to all this. But I think there's a couple of things just to highlight that, 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 are, that, that are new. So there's going to be more of a top down leadership uh, in China when it comes to semiconductors There's a new leading small group at the very top that's going to be overseeing this. Basically, the Chinese have, were, 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 have gone from allowing sort of the scientific community to drive things. This is back in the, 86, the 863 program days. Um, where there was a mu- and there was a much heavier government role. Then, with the setup of the National IC Investment Fund in 2014, the idea was to give market forces, you know, more play. And they, the view now in China is that that failed. Um, and so there's a there's a view now that China needs to figure out another approach to this. So potentially, for example, they'll have a they may have a large state-owned enterprise that play a more prominent role in in helping to drive the overall sector um, because that's worked, for example, in the aerospace and other other sectors uh, uh, where, where China has been has been successful in 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 advancing the technology uh, and particularly domestically. And so I think that's gonna that's gonna be one thing. Then there's also gonna be, as I noted earlier, more sharing of R and D uh, with key private sector companies. So those among those private sector companies are Huawei, SMIC, and Naura, that, that toolmaker I mentioned, um, and that was announced earlier this year. And so there's going to be a lot more uh, trying to leverage government R and D to, to in, in these key choke point technologies, arguably things like lithography, uh, to try to help advance the, the, the sector. And then I think the new round of the National IC Fund was just was just funded recently, uh, and it's going to focus on on toolmakers because they they now belatedly realize that the, the initial a lot of the focus was on design design and manufacturing, but it turns out that the toolmaking area has been the, the big Achilles heel, uh, given, you know, of course, the, the U.S. controls in place. Um, and then I think there's also a lot of sort of, te- of, of, of R&D going on under the radar. Huawei, for example, is has a, a tremendous amount of experience in all this manufacturing, uh, all these manufacturing technologies. And I think they're working very closely with the toolmakers and with, with companies like SMIC, obviously, um, on, on a whole range of, 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 appro- of new approaches. Um, Huawei probably realizes it should have been more like Samsung, um, uh, and, and is probably not pursuing that kind of a, a, a of a strategy. Where uh, you know Samsung has its own foundry business, so they do all the commercial uh, electronics, but they have they have a massive. Uh, foundry business that, that that manufactures most of their products, and I think Huawei probably regrets not pursuing that that strategy earlier. And then I think the the the, the one other goal is to keep access uh, to Chinese companies for critical things like materials and and things like substrates and process gases, which haven't so far been the subject of export controls. So, for example, Japan. Uh, and Taiwan and other places are critical sources of substrates and some of the, the things you actually need to do advanced manufacturing. And China's going to continue to try to keep access to those. And then I think finally that the Chinese are, are looking to, Chinese companies are looking to poach more engineers uh, and knowledge from, from companies in Japan and Korea and Taiwan, um, which is where a lot of that knowledge goes. Because really at the end of the day, the, the, this industry is about knowledge and knowledge transfer. Um, and, and so you need the people who know what they're doing um, to, to, to actually do this. The guy, for example, at SMIC, who helped them move to the seven nanometer process, but was a, a previously an executive at TSMC and Samsung. Yes. Um, and so those are the kind of people you need if China's gonna, gonna make progress in these areas. But I think you have a, a whole of government effort here and, and a whole of industry effort um, to, to try to figure out the way forward here. And, um, and that's gonna unfold over the next couple of years. 
with that uh, brilliant insight from both of you, we conclude the first part of our discussion. We uh, received a couple of fantastic questions from the audience. So let's turn to them next. The first question is for Paul T. Um, to what extent is China's AI industry, just Fox AI defined as AI pretending to be something that it is not? As with any new technology that creates a lot of hype and intrigue, AI has inspired companies to prey on the public's uh, lack of understanding Many of the Chinese companies doing this are repositioning their predictive and automation technologies as AI, when really they're just offering rule-based applications that are not governed by machine learning. Um, so it's interesting observation. Uh, Paul T, what's your take on that? Well, I think um, yes. I mean, there tends to there's sometimes there's there's an attempt to sort of you know jump on the hype. It depends on what you're talking about here, though. So generative AI is really is a new thing. Um, and, you know, again, we, we forget that it's only a year ago that ChatGPT was released by OpenAI. Um, and that that has really, uh, you know, fueled a lot of a lot of interest in China. As I mentioned, there's 238 large language models under development. But the challenge, is, 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 as in all sort of newer versions of technology, is are the, the defining the end use applications. And as I noted earlier, there are some applications where generative AI is being used um, at the enterprise level. And that's really the focus of Chinese companies. So Chinese companies aren't trying really to design a better chat GPT. They're trying to, to, to figure out real enterprise uses, but we're still at an early stage here. So for example, Baidu has 10,000 enterprise licensors of its Ernie bot um, generative AI model. Um, and, and it was really just, it was just released the, the latest version in, in August or September. And when you're, when you're talking about designing an application based on a large language model, for example, it, take, it takes at least six months to do that. Um, and so probably next year we'll see, you know, it, it, for example, in China, some of the more uh, uh, interesting use, use cases um, that will actually, you know, leverage generative AI and things like large language models. Open AI is doing the same thing in the US where they're licensing their, uh, their models um, to companies, and then companies are using them internally to do things. Now, a lot of these things aren't that sexy. They're like leveraging corporate data internally uh, to get some you know, productivity benefits. Uh, and so those are the kinds of areas where generative AI is absolutely going to have going to have um, a big impact. Um, but it sort of depends on you know, the, what you're talking about in terms of the application. Um, interestingly, getting back to the to Paul's open source question, I think that's really important because you do have companies like Kaifu's uh, 01.ai um, that, that has developed its 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 um, its model, but it's based on on Llama two, which was open sourced by Meta um, uh, this year. And so, you know, you, you do have Chinese companies um, experimenting with both their own models and also with um, with with models that have that have been developed and have been open sourced um, in 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 the U.S. And so, you know, we're sort of at the beginning stage here of the, of the generative AI. Um, revolution, arguably, and 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 finding those use cases. But already, as I noted earlier, you know, Chinese companies have been using different types of AI algorithms for a long time in real in real world applications like logistics and um, you know op object recognition and facial recognition, all sorts of things, right? So it depends on what you're talking about. Generative AI is definitely something, though, that you know we we don't know the ultimately the the economic impact and all the the key killer sort of use cases um, that will that will come out of that. But I I wouldn't you know I, there's some always some hype and we're sort of in the hype cycle on generative AI, but you know, clearly there are going to be applications as these models get better and they're trained on uh, on things like enterprise data. And that's where the real focus is in China, Huawei, Baidu, Tencent, ByteDance, you know, they're all developing these models and they're trying to leverage their unique position and their unique data sets uh, and their unique sort of experience in this in this area to help companies use their models to develop um, you know real world real world use cases. And I think, you know, in, in the coming months, we'll see more, more examples of things like the, I mentioned, the Pangu use of generative AI and other AI algorithms and 5G to do automation of, of mining uh, operations, for example, and reduce the human the human component there. So that's, some, there are a lot, there's some initial examples, but we're still at an early stage in terms of deploying uh, really sort of hard hitting and killer um, uh, generative AI applications. Fantastic. And we have an, an additional question for Paul S. How have geopolitics, uh, how have geopol uh, geopolitical risks impact TSMC's roles and strategies in the chips industry, especially where the utilization of AI tech in chips is concerned? Sure. Well, um, uh, a couple ways. Obviously, um, you know, the U.S. export controls have a big effect, um, even though TSMC is in Taiwan or outside of the United States, they rely on U.S. equipment. And so um, when the U.S. government has said, hey, you cannot ship your most advanced chips to China, uh, even if they're made 
is they're designed by a Chinese company uh, being manufactured in Taiwan and then sent back to China. If they're using U.S. tooling, you can't do that. Uh, that's one clear place where TSMC has been kind of caught in this geopolitical tug of war. Um, more broadly, of course, uh, concerns about a conflict in Taiwan. Uh, you know, the the Chinese Communist Party has been very open about wanting to absorb Taiwan into China. Um, you know, they've Xi Jinping has, has certainly said that forces is, is you know not off the table in terms of doing so. We've seen major military exercises around Taiwan. Uh, and so concerns about uh, a conflict at, you know, potentially various levels, including at the extreme end, something like a Chinese invasion of Taiwan would be enormously disruptive uh, to Taiwan as a nation, to certainly TSMC operations, uh, and, you know, in that case, to the global economy because of the reliance that the entire world has on advanced semiconductors. Um, so I think, you know, it's... it's uh, some some folks have claimed that China is the the Saudi Arabia of data. I'm actually not sure that that holds up in practice when you look at like what is a data advantage, but it's it's probably fair to talk about Taiwan as the Saudi Arabia of computing hardware. Uh, this you know this island has this just incredibly dominant position globally in terms of the role that they play, and um, TSMC is certainly on the minds of decision makers in Beijing and Washington. And we've seen them look to diversify some of their fabs, building fabs here in the United States. Their relationship with the U.S. government is obviously really key, uh, both for the company and for Taiwan overall. Um, but they're continuing to be in a very difficult position. Thank you so yeah. much, Paul S. and Paul T. for providing such valuable insights into this uh, complex intersection of military AI, U.S.-China competition, Huawei's tech journey, and the landscape of export controls and China's industrial policy. And to our audience, thank you so much for joining us on this episode of our webinar on uh, U.S.-China AI competition. I am Lizzie. Until next time, stay curious. Thank you so much, and have a good rest of the uh, have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.